Hey, Blue Demons, Courtney here from the Office of Student Involvement. Thank you so much for joining us today as we launch a new series called DePaul Stories. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot from students uh, throughout this pandemic in particular that they're just curious to, you know, learn more about DePaul and, uh, you know, while they're away or they miss parts of campus. So we've designed this series um, to just, you know, tell you a little bit more, you know, whether you've been on campus before or you're coming for the first time this fall. Um, we just want to make sure that you're set up for success and that you, you know, can take some pride in the campus around you. So. Uh, Tim, I'm really excited to kick off the series with Brother Mark, and we're talking about an awesome project called The Little School Under the Under the L. So, Brother Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here. Happy to be here. The, the complete title of the project is called The Story of the Little School Under the L. Under the L. There you go. <laughs> Great. Or LSUTL. Yeah. Code well, words. and I... I, th I think it's, you know, it's one of these great parts about DePaul when you're walking around campus. So for those of you who have, have either been on campus or if you haven't been there before, obviously uh, one of the, the draws of DePaul is we have the Fullerton L stop basically on campus, right? It's right there. And if you walk yeah, underneath, it. yeah, underneath that L station, right behind uh, the Sullivan Athletic Center, Mc McGrath Phillips Arena, um, Brother Mark has been working with students for the past few years to create these really beautiful murals. So today we're excited to show you or tell you a little bit about it. So Brother Mark, how about we start, uh, if you don't mind, can you just tell us a little bit about how this project came to fruition, how you got this idea and really how it started? Sure will. Uh, about 11 years ago, yeah, 11 years ago, I invited one of my colleagues from the public art world, uh, nationally renowned muralist, Olivia Goody, who teaches over at the Art Institute. Now she used to teach at UIC. So I invited her on campus. Uh, she did a talk. Uh, people were very excited. And uh, she had never seen uh, the mural of the Big Vinny over there at Wish Field, which, yeah, I did that too. And uh, by the way, there's a whole video on that on YouTube. We'll get to that later. Anyway, so we're walking under the yell and we walked out onto the field, looked at all the little faces of the of the uh, the Big Benny and everything, because that's what it's made of. Came back under the yell, and she just kind of offhandedly remarked, said, "You know, you should do something about these pillars here. I mean, they're just just waiting for somebody to do something with them." And I thought to myself, "Oh, oh, yeah, yeah." You know, now that went dormant for about, honestly, four years uh, before need for me uh, sparked uh, uh, a little bit of things pushing and pulling around on me uh, because my mural class, which is usually a spring event, um, needed new venues. And we also needed uh, to have the mural class basically stay at home. We used to put the mural class on wheels and we did murals all over the city during the spring. I would finish them off in the summer, uh, but uh, students don't travel that well anymore. Hmm, F go figure. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> We're getting into too many stories, Courtney. <laughs> yeah. Well, and one's I, enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I'm really, I've been really fortunate. I right, right now, I I live pretty close to um, campus, and I I walk past these every single day. And you know, I, I didn't know much about them before we had the, a chance to talk. But to hear that, you know, DePaul students have been doing them, and a little bit of the, you know, the context about it is really cool. And you know. We, it's it's taking what is a seemingly ugly pillar, right? Gray, yep. concrete, industrial, and turning it, in, it into this really important part of our DePaul history and who we are and the stories that they tell, I think are really, really powerful. And we've, we've got a couple of pictures here, some of them, but um, each pillar, uh, and I, because I, I I find myself like walking around and looking at them. They all have the stories associated with them too. So it's not just you art. It, it truly is this history. You bet. And yeah. I'll, I'll throw in the, uh, the notion that all of these stories 
were uh, basically agreed upon uh, by a representative uh, members of the DePaul community. In other words, we had open forums periodically to determine what themes would be taking up, be taken on. I mean, I didn't do all the decisions uh, by myself. Some of uh, some of the uh, themes are no brainers. Everybody could agree on rather easily. Coach Ray Meyer, for example, you know, you can't have a story about DePaul without without Coach. Uh, and it's too bad uh, some of the new students have never heard of him before. Uh, but really, you look into basketball history and you'll find Coach right, right in there uh, with all the greats. Uh, you know, George Mikan for another. This is another no-brainer. Huge basketball icon uh, in, in basketball history. Uh, you know, but there's plenty yeah, of others. Yeah, both in the that, Collegiate uh, Basketball Hall of Fame, yep. Yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of other stories, uh, especially about social justice, that students really do need to know about. Father McCabe, for example, uh, was a, a true stalwart when it comes to really understanding how, how the poor needed to have a way into the world and to have a, uh, a just and, and fair hand in dealing with the world. And uh, he was very creative and instrumental in really establishing what we know as a social justice um, uh, way of doing things here, here at DePaul, you know. Uh, and that goes, that goes back to 1910 when he started out as president here. He basically opened the doors to uh, women at DePaul, and the first time it was done in a um, collegiate uh, uh, Catholic setting, uh, opening the doors to co-education in 1911. Uh, you know, uh, basically opening the doors to many diverse groups uh, during that time, and uh, even getting fired over his uh, his his um, statements about. Uh, Oh, the British pushing on the Irish Republic in 1919, you know. So uh, somebody that uh, really understood how, how oppressed the poor could be in a, in a social justice manner. Mm -hmm. Well, in the murals, it, like you're talking about, I think one of the cool parts about it, like as I experience them, they start with, you know, obviously, DePaul was founded in 1898, and it tells that historical context. But there's also murals that tell our story of today. You know, there's yep. a mural that tells the story of the Black Student Union. And um, there's, you know, mural a mural, I think one of the most recent ones, uh, it was from uh, Doug Bruno and Jean Lunty Ponsetto and talking about, you know, women's athletics. And it's just this really cool way. Yep, there it is. Yep, you, you've got it there, too. Yep, so, you betcha. Yeah, yeah. Actually, now that you show me that, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about like the process. Like, how are these installed? What does that look like? Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, first of all, um, you know, it it came to be that uh, there had to be practical solutions to big problems uh, when you're dealing with a parking lot under the L. People are going to want to park. You know, so can you shut down a parking lot for months at a time so that you can put artwork up? No, it was very impractical. So the solution came around to the material that you see on the screen there, uh, uh, a rather inexpensive um, non-woven material called polytab. Uh, the uh, muralists like to call it parachute material and that kind of thing. It is the inside bunting of shirt collars and cuffs. You, you might even be wearing it right now. So on the video there that you can see, uh, we'll paint all of the pieces of the mural indoors in the confines of my studio or in the classroom, as it turns out to be. There's Naomi putting 
uh, acrylic gel or what I like to call goop on the back of uh, one of the pieces. And then it would be hoisted up to me or, or some of the assistants that are down there working on it. And we actually put it in like wallpaper. We, you know, uh, take little uh, spatulas and push it around so that we get all the goop bubbles out of it and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but you have to work really fast to do it because it gets, yes, very sticky and it's not always easy to work with it. So we got to hose down the whole pillar before we even put the uh, poly tab up there. And then you got to move real quick to make sure that it's up nice and perpendicular and straight. And even then you got to keep working on it. Uh, uh, there might be added pictures that you need to put on it and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Well, and I, I truth be told, I was fascinated the first time that you told me that they were, it was this process of taking it and applying it like wallpaper, because I had always assumed that they were painted directly on it. Um, but we've got another image here that is, I, uh, is you know, showing that how, how they're painted um, in studio, if you if you will. Oh yes, that's the first, that's one of the first pillars I did, oh good golly, uh, five years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, there I am in my studio, Jamie Moncrief uh, came up there, took pictures for DePaul Magazine. And yeah, this is, this is one of the byproducts of Father McCabe's uh, um, uh, administration dating back to 1911. And yes, the first women graduates at DePaul were two nuns. And uh, and they, they basically met a need in the fact that the archdiocese and many of the uh, Catholic schools in the area needed to have their teachers, many of them being nuns, to be really certified in their own educational fields. And uh, you know, uh, really be upgraded in that way. So honestly, the first uh, women graduates of DePaul in 1912 were these two particular nuns uh, that you're seeing here. So these are portraits of them. And they, they are right next to the Father McCabe pillar, as they should be, you know. <laughs> Well, and even that strategic pl placement of the pillars is fascinating to hear, right? Like that there is a, a way to experience them. But, uh, you know, I, I've got a couple other pictures here and I'm curious. I, I know, Mark, you know the stories about these, but I'm just curious if you can share with some of our viewers Certainly a little bit will. about them as well. So uh, we're going to start here uh, with, uh, once it goes through, uh, with Dolly. So uh, Good old Dolly. Dolly's a wonderful lady, and uh, she's still with us, uh, living just outside of Philadelphia in New Jersey. She was a 1952 Olympian in the long jump and the 100-meter dash. Uh, she was very much a, a world-class track star in her day in uh, the early 1950s. Uh, she won gold, med uh, gold medals at various meets, uh, did well in the Pan Am Games, uh, went to Helsinki for the Olympic Games, uh, was leading in the long jump in the Olympic Games. Uh, you know, uh, she, didn't, she didn't win, but imagine doing all of that and being a DePaul student and knowing that uh, DePaul at the time did not have a women's track team. You know, there, there you go. That, that's, that by itself is an amazing story to me, you know. Uh, so Dolly uh, got a, a degree in education. She, uh, she was a phys ed major, uh, kept, kept on coaching and uh, umpiring at uh, track meets. Uh, she still does in, in, her, in her 80s. You know, so, and she's the, uh, part of DePaul's Athletic Hall of Fame, as a matter of fact, kind of the, the godmother of the uh, track team these days. Yeah. Well, and it just goes to show, like, we, I, you know, we oftentimes use the phrase that, like, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And it's like people like Valley that paved the way for women, uh, for women of color, for people of color, 
you know, and, and it's, it's just great to see, like, to hear these stories and to see just how instrumental they really are. And I, you know, I think of no more symbolic thing than pillars as like these people who are holding up, not, I mean, physically they're holding up the train, but also holding up to Paul in our history. Um, you bet. Yeah. Well, quite, quite literally, uh, Courtney, you know, just, uh, just the notion of the concept, the little school under the L was kind of the watchwords of how we originated as a school. Uh, if you go back to the early 1900s, the first decade in the 1900s, uh, the first, you know, the first uh, chance we got to build buildings outside of the church complex right there at Sheffield and Webster was to go across the street by the L at Sheffield and build under the L. Uh, many of the first buildings uh, on the street there uh, were of that nature. So people just naturally gave us that name, Little School Under the L. And that's, well, and I that's remember why I use it. <laughs> yeah, well, and my, my family's from the Chicagoland area. And I remember my grandma referring to DePaul as that growing up too, because that's what she knew, right? Um, yep. Yeah, so you know, I, I'm really excited, Brother Mark, for you to talk about Dr. Hooks, because for those of you who don't know, Dr. Hooks had a really important place, not only in DePaul's history, but American history as well. Oh, you betcha. Dr. Benjamin Hooks was uh, a Medal of Freedom winner, Presidential Medal of Freedom winner back in uh, 2008, I believe. No, excuse me, a little bit before that, 2006, he was awarded the medal by uh, Pres President Bush, George W. Bush, uh, mainly because he was a real advocate of civil rights, as you might expect. Came to DePaul because he had this very, very strong need to be a lawyer and to really advocate uh, for social justice issues, uh, which really stemmed from him being in the army during World War II. And uh, he, was, he was guarding Italian prisoners uh, at a restaurant that he couldn't eat at. The prisoners could eat at, but he couldn't because he was black. And that, needless to say, really spurred something in him to... Uh, really become more of a, an advocate for these uh, real social injustices that he saw in the world. So he came to DePaul because there were absolutely no law schools uh, around in, in Memphis, Tennessee, and, and anywhere in the South uh, that would admit blacks. So he started looking north and he came, he, his brother lived here in Chicago so he came here to Chicago, started exploring law schools here, uh, walked into, uh, at that time, uh, oh, now I'm forgetting names, but he walked into the president's office, just, you know, and they, and they talked briefly and uh, basically uh, uh, Father Comerford O'Malley, uh, basically said, well, can you pay, pay to go to law school? Looks like you're an articulate fellow. And he said, yeah, I got a GI Bill. Oh, well, all right, you're in. And he liked the feel of the place. And this is a very important thing that we have to really remember about ourselves is the personal connections one-to-one -one with every student that comes in the doors, no matter how big we get, we have to really be very much of service to each student. And this is what happened to Benjamin Hooks. And uh, his two years at the law school were very beneficial to him. He went back to Memphis, uh, was eventually appointed as the first criminal law judge of African-American uh, descent in the state of Tennessee, was appointed by President Nixon to uh, be the head of the FCC, uh, did a number, uh, was 
eventually the head of the NC, excuse me, the uh, NAACP. I didn't want to get too athletic there, but needless to say, he was he was uh, he was a nationally known figure. Uh, he was not only a judge, but he he was also a, a Baptist minister, and uh, you know somebody for every uh, every aspect of social justice that you can depend on, uh, and. Eventually, yes, in 2006, he was uh, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He, too, was one of these people that uh, came across uh, the discussion board and people said, huh, no brainer, got to put him up, you know. So uh, much of what you see in the whole of the collection is uh, people coming together and, and uh, you know, saying, yeah, th this person really is part of our story. Yeah, well, and it's amazing to hear, like, because we do have all of these people that, you know, have have such dynamic and rich histories as part of this. And I really appreciate what it, what you said, Brother Mar, about, like, remembering the individual and remembering the impact, because I think, like, that's who we are as a Vincentian institution. Like, we pay attention to the individual so that they can go out and change the world. And, like, Dr. Hooks is a phenomenal example of that and just to hear like, like see some of those stories in history um and actually that brings us to the next person that we've got um here in our our uh side deck that i think did that also very well and you, you talked about him a little bit but coach meyer right like coach meyer yep. was also all about those relationships yep and uh uh coach ray was uh somebody that i uh I got the pleasure of uh, having many conversations with, as an undergrad, when I, when I was here back in the mid 70s, I was here 76, 77, 78. Uh, and uh, the, the basketball team was right up there on, on uh, doing great things and being uh, noticed nationwide. Coach was uh, an innovator in many ways, but he, he started out uh, having an interest in the priesthood, believe it or not. Uh, it, and it's back then, back when he was growing up, there was, a, there was uh, many, many young, young men interested in the priesthood. Even Doug Bruno was interested in the priesthood at one time back in the day. Uh, many are called, few are chosen. Let's put it that way and move on. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? Uh, but he, but uh, you know, the lure of basketball is something that uh, uh, sometimes you're. It's the best way to express yourself, and Coach certainly did indeed express himself through basketball. He was inventive through basketball. Take for example, George uh, uh, George Mikan. Uh, George Mikan was passed over by a few schools, but it takes talent to see talent. And Coach had that ability to see that in a particular person. If it was there, he could bring it out of them. And uh, that's one of the great things that Coach brought to DePaul uh, for all of his 40 years that he was coaching here. So uh, Coach took a, a raw talent in, in a person like George Mikan and did rather revolutionary things with a re, with um, what you might call an underutilized uh, raw talent and refined that talent and made uh, revolutionize the game of basketball by doing it because uh, before George Mikan, uh, big men weren't thought to be as useful in the game of basketball as they are now. And that was, that was through coach's work right there with George Mikan, you know, uh, needless to say, uh, the game evolved uh, and coach had to involve, uh, evolve with it. Uh, coach was always very approachable. You know, if, if, uh, if you were coaching a, a grade school team like I was 
for a little bit in the uh, uh, while I was here as an undergrad. You could you could ask coach anytime. So coach, I got got this press I'd like to put on uh, with my grade school team, and he said, "Now, bro, you got to make sure that you have these guys doing this and that, you know." And and you know, it didn't matter how busy we, he was as long as it wasn't in practice. If you you know. If he had an interest in in what you were doing, you had all his time, and it was it was great. So, coach uh, was uh, um, somebody that uh, was a real affluent and uh, vital person here at DePaul back in the day. Yeah, well, and that spirit I think is one like that leadership style overall and generally is one that we still see. With our athletics program, you know, like exactly what you're describing is how I imagine Coach Bruno will be. And I have to imagine how part of the reason why Coach Stubbs wanted to be part of this environment, too, is because we are th that kind of a community. So um, one of the the other things that I think is really cool, and Brother Mark, if I, we can bug you for a couple more minutes, I'm going to ask you to tell a couple more stories Um uh, the pillars not only tell stories about people, but they also tell stories about DePaul's history um and one yeah. of the most frequent questions we get is why are we the blue demons and yeah. we've we've got got some pillars that can help us help us tell that story as well so i'll turn it back over to you yeah and it's kind of noteworthy to uh to really add to this in the fact that each year the president's office gets we'll call them complaint letters that uh, from uh uninformed people uh, that basically say, how is it that a Catholic institution could have as their mascot a devil? And uh, we have to say, well, it's not how it seems. And it's very innocent as to how this really came about. So there's, George, uh, there's Joe Wilhoyt there, who is, by the way, one, our one and only Major League Baseball player because he played all the sports back in the day. Uh, Joe dates back to 1908, and he was, in the, he was in that first group of students that went from uh, St. Vincent's College in uh, November and December of 1907 into DePaul University in January of 1908. And he was on the first Blue Demon basketball team. But they weren't called Blue Demons back then. They were called the D-Men because they wore D monograms on their letter sweaters or their pullover letter sweaters. Uh, and those sweaters were, you know, the kinds of warm-up things that they wore out onto the field. They were very versatile and very useful and very thick, by the way. Uh, back, you know, it's a cold Chicago winter, by dog, you're gonna you're gonna want something that that thick and very very versatile. So uh, the first uh, the first groups of uh, students that were athletes uh, after, you know, from 1908, uh, I'll say through the uh, through about 1919 or so, were known as the D Men. the The university was considered the Blue D-Men and the uh, DePaul Academy, which was the, uh, the sister school that was right there on campus uh, for the boys in high school, were known as the Red D-Men. But they were both known as D-Men because they wore the monogram D. And, uh, you know, a guy like Joe Wilhoyd, he played all the sports. He was a... Uh, Four sport letterman uh, was on the first uh, uh, D men basketball team, which, by the way, had their first game on the sixth floor of Burn Hall. But uh, did you know that? <laughs> and no. if you go up there now and get off the elevator, you'll say, "Where? What?" <laughs> and you walk down the hall, and you'll feel the. You'll feel the black basketball floor under your feet because it's still there, but it's all oh, wow. offices now. Yeah. You know, but it, but it's but that's where they played. Yeah. Because that's all they had. Well, you I know. I love that. I'm gonna like I'm gonna go up there and take a look at that. 
But the other thing I love about that story is the fact that there were red D men. I had no, I knew, I knew a little bit about the history of the D men, um, but I had no idea that there. Why I didn't know why it was blue. I had done a little bit of like reading online and that it was our school colors, but I didn't know there was a red D men as well. Well, they did have an election. Uh, they did have a, a an election for school colors in 1900. You know, shortly after the beginning of of the school. And they had uh, high school aged boys and they had college age uh, students and they had to really start di differentiating a little bit. So the high school ended up being DePaul Academy, which uh, was, they had a thousand boys at one time going up to 1968. Yeah, if you can imagine that building uh, with a thousand boys in it, I mean, it's like, oh, phew. But they did. I, I can tell you other stories at another time. Uh, but they were given the red color with blue piping. And then uh, mm. to differentiate with from the university, the university was given the blue color with red piping or red as a secondary color. Uh, the red represents, uh, you know, uh, passion mm. and and compassion in that way and the blue represents loyalty uh my kind of blue that you see under the l yeah it's more french it's the ultramar ultramarine blue which is uh very french and very uh you know, i'll say it's a little closer to to what we are as a french community uh, i'll say uh, for lack of a better way to put it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, there's one other story I want before we end our time together, um, because this is something that, you know, we hear from a lot of our students, um, but they joke at DePaul or like they'll say like, oh, DePaul's never had a football team, which is not true. We have Not had true. So not true at I'm all. Just curious if you can tell us a little bit about the football team. In this oh, year. happy to. Uh, the very student center that uh, you make your living out of, Courtney, used to be our football field. Uh, before that, it was before the student center, it was Alumni Hall. And before that, it was the football field. And that football field went from Belden all the way to the back windows of the church. And we played baseball there. We had track there. And, and needless to say, uh, football as well. Uh, if you can imagine, home plate used to be uh, where the uh, Vincentians have their dining room right now. <laughs> I've, I've been in that dining room. I know where there you is. go. Yeah, that, that was that was home plate. So if oh, you wow. if you were a left-handed hitter, you had an advantage because you could hit a home run going over uh, the wall at Sheffield. <laughs> yeah, it was a yeah. long poke all the way to Belden, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But needless to say, yes, they they had many games there on on what is now the parking lot. Uh, but they also had games at Soldier Field as well as Wrigley Field. As a matter of fact, in, uh, up until recently when Northwestern had a game at Wrigley Field, the last game uh, that was there as a collegiate, uh, intercollegiate game, was uh, the 1938 game uh, that we had against uh, Loyola. Uh, you know, uh, why? Uh, we won. We won? I'd have to look it up, but I'm not oh. going to give it. Why? It's not promising if we, we got rid of the now? team after that year. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it gets, it gets into money and success. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, we're a landlocked university. Land is scarce, and when and uh, you know go out to Notre Dame, what do you see? Plenty of land, and and with that, plenty of money. <laughs> uh, we we've we've got more money than we used to have, but we don't have that much land, you know. And uh, um, there was a debate about going at the end of. Uh, 1937 going into 1938 uh, at the level of the Board of Trustees and they they 
the football team was losing money a lot. And it, it takes a lot of money to field a football team and deal with scholarships, you know, and um, they just, they, they couldn't reconcile it. So they said, nope. And honestly, uh, you know, even though people were sad to see the football team go, um, nobody was really that broke up about it, you know, uh, and needless to say, all the attention went to the basketball team after that, you know, yeah. so, uh, but that's, that's the truth. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, and, you know, I just think it, it's, I, I so appreciate hearing about this story and all the stories and just, it, it, it just goes to show, you know, I think sometimes we just as humans get stuck in this like tunnel of like, we only think about the things that are immediately in front of us, right? Or we only think That's about right. our experience or the history and the story of the people around us and what they can tell. But, you know, a place like DePaul, right, it, we have such a rich history. And going from our doors opening in 1898 to, you know, St. Vincent, as you just showed us there, I mean, we we have centuries of history as an institution. So, you know, Brother Mark, I'm sure people have said it to you, but I, I just so appreciate this project and that it tells the story of DePaul and really that it, it has this capa capacity to tell the story of DePaul for generations to come. Um, so as we conclude, I don't, I don't know if there's anything, any final thoughts, things to share that you want to share with our viewers? Well, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can, but I, needless to say, I've got a whole laundry list I could share with you, but I'll keep it to three points. One, uh, students will have a chance uh, this coming fall to add uh, their little bits to the, to the collection under the L. We're going to have a COVID pillar uh, where, where uh, members of the class can actually uh, make a mask for the COVID pillar, kind of get into their own thoughts about how COVID uh, affected them and, and the university. Secondly, uh, we're, we're about, I'll say, just a few pillars away from ending the project, uh, getting up to really two dozen pillars. Uh, so by, the, by hopefully December of uh, 2022, uh, we'll be at the end of the project. And with that, in January of 2023, we're going to have a closing show in the Richardson Gallery of Richardson Library, uh, which will feature all the illustration boards and a number of painted basketballs. Uh, like, for example, uh, the Meyer family is going to get a painted basketball featuring uh, Coach Ray, the Hooks family we'll get a painted basketball uh, featuring uh, Dr. Hooks. And uh, needless to say, uh, Dolly already knows she's getting a painted uh, basketball about her uh, for her family, as you might imagine. So uh, all of the people that are being depicted in the pillars will get uh, one, of these, one of these painted basketballs and they will be on display. That's great. Well, Brother Mark, thank you again so much for, for joining Thanks us Thanks for the opportunity. And yeah. So uh, students, DePaul community members, if there's other stories that you want to hear about DePaul, let us know. Um, just shoot us an email at involvement at depaul.edu, and we're, we're happy to continue to tell this and other DePaul stories. But if you want to find out more about the murals in particular, um, you can go to uh, the website listed here on the screen, blogs.depaul.edu slash Fullerton L Pillars. Um, and you can read a little bit more about the stories that Brother Mark shared today um, and others. All of the, the pillars have the stories there. There's links to the videos that Brother Mark referenced um, and just a lot more information if you want to find out more. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, Brother Mark, I, I, I'm sure you'd be happy to share this too, but you will see Brother Mark all over campus. He's got a signature hat. Um, you, you can't miss him, and, and he's a great guy to talk to. But um, until next time, we hope you all continue to stay safe, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye, Blue Demons.